Well, greetings. How are we doing? Good. So it was, uh, it was about 10 years ago that I was sitting in these chairs. Uh, so it, it, it's an honor and a privilege to be uh, here with you guys today. Uh, I was out with my executive team this morning uh, for a, an early breakfast, and they said, hey, did you know that Mitt Romney's speaking today for, for devotional, or that we think he is? And I said, how? seriously? How am I going to follow that act? And then they said, wait, no, I think it's tomorrow. So I guess I'm good. Um, let's see. So we got our clicker here. All right, so I want to go ahead and start out with a, a quote. My, one of my dad's favorite old actors is John Wayne. And uh, John Wayne said, life is hard. It's harder if you're stupid. And in business, uh, that's, that, that's part of the point, is you guys are going to get going in whatever it is that you're going to go chase, whatever entrepreneurial venture you're going to chase. And you're going to learn uh, the school of hard knocks. It's just how it goes. The secret is, can you learn from your experiences? And it'll grow from there. So the question is, how do I avoid dumb tax? So I had a, a professor here named Kirby Cochran. I'm not sure if Kirby still teaches here, but it was in one of my new ventures classes. And uh, he coined this phrase, dumb tax. And along the way, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And for those of you who have seen Dumb and Dumber, uh, the, the first one, I haven't seen the second one, uh, you've got Lloyd Christmas and Harry, and they've, they're trying to travel across America to take a suitcase back to this woman in Aspen. And along the way, they run out of money halfway through, uh, which some of you may find in your, in your business. And Lloyd gets this amazing idea to say, let's trade our van for a moped, because you know, gas mileage would be much less expensive to get there. And so they do that. Little do they realize you know, along the way that they're going to end up freezing, driving up to Aspen. And you can see the, you know, the snot frozen across their noses. Um, but lo and behold, they got there, but not without a few battle scars. So I look at business very much the exact same way. All right, so a quick bio. I, I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. Served my mission in Panama City. Uh, came back to BYU. Uh, I've already gone over some of these other items. I've, I've got a, a daughter who's two years old. I've got another daughter that's on the way. So really just barely starting my family. And we've got our, our dog, Harley, who's eight years old. He was really my first son. And uh, a few hobbies, beach volleyball, snowboarding, international travel, guitar, film. I'm a movie buff, love film. And then in business. I hope that many of you see business not as work. I hope that you can see it as a hobby. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. My wife would actually tell you that really business is my hobby. And occasionally I internationally travel. And I used to do a lot of these other things back in college. So Altera, uh, went over our introduction already. You know, we'll, we'll do about $50 million this, year, this fiscal year in revenue. This is our third year. So typically in private equity, you know, the goal is you got to be able to at least show $50 million within five years. We've been able to do it in three. I've already had two other entrepreneurial ventures prior to this that we uh, had li liquidity, to be, liquidity events for um, and were sold for in the tens of millions of dollars. All right, so I want to set the stage. What I'm hoping is that you guys can learn from my experience. So I came back off my mission from Panama, and I ended up working at a snowboard and wakeboard shop, which I thought was awesome. Got discounts on clothes. I uh, got to have an amazing time in the wintertime. And in the summertime, we'd go out every morning uh, and ride, basically go out and wakeboard, come back in the afternoon, like around noon, sit by the pool, read a book for an hour, and then i go to work and sell wakeboards for the rest of the day. And one of my buddies had a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Has anybody read this book before? Wow, I'm impressed. OK, so very simple book. But it's, it, it's one of those basic elementary books to help you understand the accumulation of wealth and how to make smart decisions with your money. And I, at that point, I decided someday I'm going to, if I, if I find an opportunity, I'm going to take it. And one of my buddies came to me and said, hey, uh, I went last year to California. And I sold pest control door to door. And I made about 25 grand. Do you want to go with us this summer? We're going with a bunch of friends. And I said, get out of Utah for the summertime? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I, real, I thought if I could just focus on grades, because I wanted to go to MBA school. If I could just focus on grades, not have to work, you know, maybe graduate debt free, you know, have money for a wedding ring, save up for some grad school, that'd be awesome. So I took off to Sacramento, California to go work for Clark Pest Control. It's a really big, large, $100 million pest control company. And uh, I found a problem. It turns out I wasn't very good at sales. Uh, for five days, I sold zero. I was probably the worst person out of the 200 salespeople that they had working for them. 
And it was tough. Uh, I actually got to go home to my brother's wedding and talk to my parents about it. You know, and everybody's saying, so how's it going out in California? And, oh, it's coming along. <laughs> had to bite my tongue. One of the issues that they had was there wasn't a whole lot of training. And the training manual was more, techni it was more technical as opposed to sales oriented. Uh, they didn't require you to go out with anybody and learn how to sell. They didn't have videos. Uh, there's a lot of issues with it. And uh, luckily, I started reading. And I think that's a big thing with entrepreneurs is when the tough gets going, the, or when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And so you, you make a conscious decision, okay, I'm going to start studying harder. I'm going to start working harder. I'm going to work longer hours. I'm going to read outside sales books. I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn how to sell. And luckily, I, I figured it out. The day I got back, I sold four. And from then on, every day I was selling, and I ended up becoming the top rookie in the company. I yearned for a way to improve and to break free from that model. I realized it was a big company. I got to learn a lot while I was there. And the next year when I came back, I thought, oh, I'll look around a little bit and see if there's what other companies out there might be offering something. I really wanted to learn from the best. This might be one of the most important things I say this entire meeting or entire lecture. Success breeds success. If you can surround yourself with successful people, you will in turn be eventually become successful if you learn from them. So I searched out top reps that were in the industry. I found a company, a very small company in Dallas, Texas, that had a sales rep that had sold 500 accounts, and another one that had sold 400 the previous year that would eventually sell 500. And I said, I want to learn from those people because I want to be better than I was my first year. So I was hired on as a sales manager. And then I found another problem. When I actually got there, they didn't have a training manual at all. <laughs> they had no training program. And so out of self-interest, I went to the owner. I said, hey, can I write a training manual for you guys? Can I put together something? Can I put together training videos with you? Now, my, my boss was an awesome guy, amazing at sales training. We just didn't have anything at the time. And he was so impressed with the fact that I was willing to do all these things, he actually picked me and said, hey, you're the guy for next year. You're going to be you know, our, our director of summer sales or vice president of sales for the company. And we ended up putting together the top program in the industry. Our sales reps on average every year consistently would do 200 sales per rep, which is almost double what most other companies were doing at that time. And I said it didn't matter if there were much bigger companies than us. Because we were strategically better and we could make our, our employees more money, they would stick with us and we could grow that way. All right, so I want to talk about opportunity. So a lot of people talk about luck in life. And opportunity is really when luck meets preparation. So I was studying finance, thinking I was going to go to uh, an investment bank, either in New York or out in San Francisco. And I had a 3.8 GPA. I was, I was in the clubs. You know, I was, I was really planning on doing that. I had an awesome resume. I had leadership over about 100 people. Uh, I was making six figures while I was still in college. I thought all that stuff would be really impressive to an investment bank. And I was about to do interviews. And then my boss comes to me and says, I'm out. I'm selling my company. And he says, if you were really going to go work 80 or 90 hour weeks as an investment banker, you should go put that time into starting your own pest control company. So out of chance, he just happened to be selling his company. I, I don't believe he would have ever have done this, you know, come and talk to me had he not been selling his company. So he, he encourages me to start my own company and offers to actually teach me how to do it. So I had a, I had a big dilemma I faced. Do I put aside this fancy lifestyle of being an investment banker, going into mergers and acquisitions, or going and doing venture capital you know, in, in California? Or do I go become a business owner in an industry that, quite honestly, wasn't very sexy? And I looked at the stats. 80% you know, of businesses fail in five years. And after 10 years, 97% of businesses are out of business. Do I really want those odds for you know, someone just barely coming out of college? And there's a couple of stats I want to read off to you guys. I'm not sure. Do you guys know how many people are entrepreneurs in the United States? In 2013, there was an article that just barely came out in Forbes. It said we're at the record high for entrepreneurship. 13% of people are entrepreneurs. Now, of those, of all the mom and pop businesses or anybody that owns their own business, how many of them are doing a million dollars in revenue or, or more a year? Anybody guess? 5%. Anybody guess how many are doing $10 million or $10 million in revenue or more per year? 
percent. So those are the kinds of odds you're up against if you're thinking about building some sort of a massive company. <coughs> and then in one of my entrepreneurship classes, I read the E-Myth. Do you guys still have to read this? Oh, you guys are missing out. So write this book down. You gotta read it. It's a basic read. And one of the things, this is the, the only thing I really remember from it, is it talks about mitigating risk. And it says, look, if you wanna avoid dumb tax, there's two things you gotta have. Number one, you gotta have experience. Not just experience in business, but experience in that specific industry. Know, exact, know exactly what you're doing. Basically, if you've already done it before, you can replicate it. And then number two is cash. Cash is king. You gotta have, I would suggest, three times as much money before you get into a business, because you have no, no idea what you're gonna bleed when you get into it. It's just you don't know what you don't know. All right, so I decided ultimately to go start my own pest control company. And I was so scared, I licensed my old boss's company name to do it. Uh, because I figured that the people would follow me over if it had the same business name. Uh, he would visit once a year at my location and you know, give, give kind of a speech. And uh, it was great to have a mentor to be able to call from time to time. So things that I learned. I learned every job in this business. I knew it better than anybody. Why? Because the e-myth told me I've got to have experience. I've got to know it very, very well. So I learned everything from the products, the operations, you know, how to hire, uh, how to use the customer software, uh, payroll, licensing, accounting, taxes, insurance, you name it. There's so many different little things that go into business that you don't even think about. I wrote down job descriptions for every single one so that I could ensure that best practices uh, were instituted and that everybody would do it the right way. Or at least they had a guide for the right way. Uh, I worked 90 hour weeks. I busted my tail. Because when you take everything you have, I had about $300,000 that I'd saved over the course of four years doing summer sales. My wife and I had saved up for graduate school. My wife, luckily, she got a scholarship to law school. And so I was able to take everything I had and throw it into my business. When you throw everything, in, in, everything you've earned up to a certain point in your life into your business, you're gonna work 90 hour weeks to make sure it works. I did that for about two years, and little by little, I've scaled back. Uh, it was a huge success. Uh, we grew the, just that first year I did it. We were three times the size of the average branch location at the company I'd previously worked for. And I almost outgrew my capital. I almost went bankrupt the first year because we had so much success. I had to go to some of my top salespeople and tell them, can I pay you 10% interest just so that I can hang on to your money for an extra two months, three months, until I have enough money to pay you back. So another, another interesting lesson. Uh, years three and four, we expanded into San Diego. So I got to test the business model. I got to know, you know, is this thing that I've created, will it work without me being there every single day? And so I'd work half the time in Corona and then half the time in San Diego. I actually used to drive about 55 minutes to work every day because my wife was going to law school in Malibu. We lived in Santa Monica and I would drive to Corona back and forth. Eventually, we ended up moving down to San Diego where she got her first <coughs> securities fraud lit uh, litigation job, and I would drive an hour and 20 minutes back and forth between the two to make it work. So I got to a point where I was trying to decide, what do I do now? You know, I've done this for four years. I kind of thought this would be a great stepping stone into MBA school, you know, where I could go on and chase my investment dr banking dream or get into uh, private equity. And I decided to sell my company. Uh, it turns out that was really just the first chapter in my, my environmental services experience. So I sold my first cap company, got a ton of capital. Took it, threw it all back into business. So same thing I did the first time. Only this time I had millions of dollars as opposed to 300 grand. Uh, we opened up four locations per year for three years in a row. And it was fascinating learning about each different state, how business operates differently, how to try to run a company going back and forth, running all over you know, the western United States. There was lots of travel involved, guys. And I eventually learned how to let go. This is one of the greatest entrepreneur dilemmas that you will run into, is letting other people run with it and trusting them. If your systems are good and they know what they're supposed to do, you've just gotta let them go. But I about killed myself traveling all over the country for sometimes five days a week. I learned how to create layers of management to effectively operate. This is probably the coolest thing about being an entrepreneur. Growth equals opportunity for your people. There is nothing like 
helping people come into, uh, my best example is my, my director of operations now. He came in to work for me for an extra $200 a month. He was making, I think, $2,700 a month with my company when he started. He now makes you know, a six-figure income working for us. This is somebody who doesn't have a college degree, just he's got that grit. He has that, that knowledge and that experience, and he continues to build on it, reads books all the time. Um, just an amazing guy. And it's so fun to be able to have taken uh, lead technicians and people and have them grow uh, where they're all making six-figure incomes now. And we ended up becoming the number one fascist growing uh, national company. So as we were growing, this was uh, in 2008 that I sold my first company. And what was going on in 2008 at the time? Do you guys remember? I still feel like we're in it. In case, yeah, so we just went through this massive recession. Worst recession in my lifetime. Probably the worst recession you'll ever have in your lifetime. And we tightened up our belts in order to in order to get through it. I had no idea how it was going to affect our business model. And so a lot of the little fun things that we used to do from company breakfasts to different little incentives, they, they all went away because we were trying to prepare. That's what I saw everybody else doing in, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the second issue I had was we were expanding really quickly and we were becoming, we were becoming more corporate. And uh, typically when you hear corporate, you probably don't associate that with a very positive thing. There's a little bit more bureaucracy. Um, there was a little bit more, well, this is what the rule is, so you just have to follow the rules. A little bit more letter of the law as opposed to spirit of the law. And then third, as we are growing so fast, if you think you don't have time when you're in a couple million dollar company, imagine when you have to work for a 10, 20, 30 million dollar company and how much time you have to spend with each employee and really get to know people. My favorite thing about my first company is I knew, I knew all of my employees. I, I knew their kids' names. I knew what they liked to do. And as we started getting bigger, it was, just, it was just not possible anymore. So I came across a book by Tony Shea. You guys know who he is? He's the founder of Zappos. It's a billion dollar company. It's now owned by Amazon. And this book, I would suggest everybody read this. It's one of the, for me, probably one of my top favorite books, top three I've ever read. Basically it says, look, if you're going through a lot of growth and you're becoming more corporate, your, your solution is culture. Your solution is having core values. Your solution is having fun. It's finding ways so that all your employees know that you care about them and making them want to stick around for reasons. So you can see a lot of this through Google, Apple, a lot of the tech companies that are great with millennials in terms of all the different um, methods that they've implemented over the years to keep them around and keep them excited. All right, so I ended up selling my second company. That was a really tough one for me because uh, I never thought I would. I thought it would be something we just keep growing. We wanted to build a better company and not just a bigger one. Uh, our goal was to actually make pest control sexy, which is pretty hard to do. It's a pretty old school blue collar industry. So we came up with a list of, uh, this is only a few of dozens of different items, um, but we had this continual idea of, hey, we, you guys know what Kaizen is? It's the uh, it's basically this Japanese art of continually improving, never being satisfied with where you're at. So a few things that we came up with were core values. We actually asked all of our employees, you know, what, what should represent our company in terms of core values? And so we came up with about 10 of them. Uh, we started out with about 200 that we whittled down into this number. Uh, we, we came up with our social mission, you know, where we were going to give 10% of our profits back to nothing but nets, you know, to an actual good cause. So it wasn't just about profits for ourselves. Uh, I personally, I said for the next five years, I won't take a salary. I'll take a $1 salary per year until, you know, we've really invested back in the company into having our employees make more, um, you know, doing more things like medical benefits, dental benefits, 401k plans. We, uh, we really used Facebook and Instagram as a way to help communicate through the company what our vision was and who we were as a company. Came up with the new headquarters. So, we had a company called Rap Studios design all of our headquarters for us. And we wanted to make it feel sexy like a Silicon Valley, something you'd see in Silicon Valley. So we, we put in everything from a break room with a you know, ping pong, foosball, air hockey, uh, pool table, uh, a movie room with bleachers so that our, our salespeople could come in and watch BYU games together. Uh, we have many guys that like to play golf and they can't play golf in the wintertime, so I put in a golf simulator. Uh, we put in a basketball court. 
and we actually have our own basketball league in the company. So we, we went around and we kind of asked all the guys, what, if you could have this amazing office, what would you do? What would you have us do? And this is one of my ways to compete our growing pains for getting bigger and making sure that my employees know that I still care about them, even though they may not have as, quite as close a relationship with me. Other ways, sales technologies. Uh, we've invested about $700,000 to $800,000 into different technologies, um, ways to help our sales reps sell more. So everything from papers, paperless agreements to scheduling customers to knowing the nearest 100 customers around you if you're in an area so you can use names uh, to drop, uh, keeping track of doors knocked, sales tournaments. We gave away about $300,000 just in sales tournaments and prizes that we've come up to help the guys sell more. More growing pains. So we, you guys can sense, when, when you start as a mom and pop, you start as a small business. The thing that you probably love, will love the most is getting to know people and seeing the changes in their lives that the company makes with them. We've, I started coming up with all these different ideas. When I was young, there was no way when our business was young that we could have invested this much money to help the company grow. It just, just wasn't possible. And with more money, with more success, with more growth, that starts to become a reality. And so every year we take our salespeople, it took 65 sales managers in September to Hawaii. Every year we go to a different island with all the salespeople. And we do just a dozen activities over the course of three days. I got 10 season tickets at the, uh, jazz in the, for the jazz in the lower bowl. It's just another way that I can communicate and go talk with the sales reps and let them know that I care. We fly all of our branch managers, all of our operations people come in once a year and we have a ton of different lessons and meetings that typically they will give to everybody else so we can learn what the most successful branches are doing. And then uh, this is us going to Moab and jeeping. Uh, next year, I think we're going to Las Vegas. And then other things, uh, in our, we've got this giant basketball gym, we'll have company parties, you know, and, and do some sort of a dance. We've had um, Dan Reynolds from Magic Jack Dragons come play for us. We've had Tyler Glenn from Neon Trees come play for us. What I found is it's really, really important to share your vision with people. And as people capture that vision, your company can grow. So one of our aspirations is, is to get in the Inc. 5000 this year. Uh, when we hit our 100,000th customer last year, we you know, went out and did a spoof and gave jazz tickets to the 100,000th customer and gave them some shirts and some other things. Celebrating success is a really big part of, of what we do. Uh, we, we will find key employees and explain to them what their growth opportunities are. That's really, really important. You want a business to grow, you need to find the right people, and then you need to help get them excited about where it is they can go with the company. And then another thing is ask for feedback. We, we pay our customers $5 just to take a survey about our company and what their experience was like with their last service. We pay our employees $50 for each idea that they bring to us that actually gets implemented in their branch or even throughout the company. I think those are, those are really, really important. The further you get away from the front lines, the more you need to be listening to your people to know what they want or to be listening to your customers so you can create raving fans. All right, so tips for success as an entrepreneur. I've talked a lot about my company. I want to talk a little bit about what you guys are going to need, depending upon whatever business you go into. So number one, conquer your fears. Fear is something, fear is the four letter F word in entrepreneurship. It kills countless dreams. It, it paralyzes people from doing what they know they really want to do in life. How many of us have set you know, a goal in January? And how many of us finish it? I think I read some, an article, I think it was like 2% of people actually you know, are still doing whatever habit is that they created on, uh, for their New Year's resolutions. So your real enemy is fear, not your competitors. Find the inner gladiator inside you and put him in charge. Uh, problems are just muscle builders. I hope that you guys, you, you look at failure and you get hungry after you fail uh, from something. Uh, I love the comparison between a gladiator and an entrepreneur because business is the one place where if you get in the, every time you get in the ring, you are more likely to die. Because every year that goes on in business, statistically, after 10 years, you know, 97% of businesses are out of business. Kill the story that you keep telling yourself over and over. I don't know that I can do this. Uh, I'm probably not good enough. Oh, that's probably too hard. That's probably not going to work. We all get what we tolerate in life. You can choose to shape your destiny. And you just got to make that decision. And then you got to work really hard. 
And you know what? If you, if you fail, as long as you learn from it, it's really not failure. And then uh, entrepreneurship, it's a place for gladiators, not dabbling wannabes. Know your why. If you know your why, the how will come later. You've got to gain leverage over yourself then by writing down dozens of reasons why you want something so bad. Initially, guys, I've got to be honest. Like All this stuff was really exciting to me in the beginning, and I've been able to achieve a lot of that. But at the end of the day, like this is where it's really, this is what it has to become. Because once you've made money, it, it's going to go really, really fast. It, I mean, it's fleeting. I mean, you can, you can have those things, and you get there, and you realize this is it. This is, this is all, this is, this is how it feels to drive a Lamborghini, and that's it. The ability to help people, this concept that business is spiritual, pour your soul into your work and expand yourself. It involves faith, courage, growth, charity. And it will give you numerous chances to be able to, to grow personally and to help others grow. Uh, I love that quote by uh, Maximus from Gladiator. What we do in life echoes throughout eternity. There's three door-to-door -door billionaires up here, which I thought was kind of interesting. So uh, learn how to sell. Uh, I think Scott already pitched this, but just this whole concept. You've got to learn how to sell. Everything begins with sales. And it's, it's not just great in sales and marketing and executive leadership, but also with your spouse and parenting with your children um, and being a church leader. I love the quote, I'll pay more for the ability to handle people than any other ability under the sun, John D. Rockefeller. And then Mark Cuban, if you're willing to go door to door, you can sell anything. Choose your employees wisely. Uh, people will either inspire you or they'll drain you. Uh, Jim Collins, you know, focus getting the right people on the bus and getting the wrong people off. And then also focus on getting them in the right positions if they're with you. So a couple favorite quotes of mine. Tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you where you'll be in five years. Another one is, you can't play with the pigs and not expect to get dirty. And another one, you can't expect to soar with eagles if you're hanging around a bunch of turkeys. The people that you let in will either build or take away from your organization. The second you find out that they're taking away, get rid of them. Let them go. It's part of becoming a very good business owner. Uh, man, I'm trying to think. I think it was Warren Buffett that said, as far as uh, your reputation goes, it could take 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Choose your spouse wisely. They say happy wife, happy life, but I guess someone didn't get the memo. Really important that your wife's on board with what you want to do. Uh, luckily, my wife, because she went to law school, she was working all the time, I was working all the time, and we supported each other through our career goals. Uh, I love being able to have an intellectual conversation with her as well. Stand for something better. And I can't stress this one enough, guys, because my father, I grew up with my father telling me, you will lose your soul in business if you're not careful. My mom used to always tell me integrity is what you do when nobody else is looking. I, I totally believe that. Uh, the end does not justify the means. You know, in, in our industry, you, you, when you hear the, the term summer sales, some of you probably think, mm. yeah, you, you probably had friends go do it, maybe come home early, not finish the summertime. Some of them were maybe taught some interesting sales tactics. And uh, you've got to decide now what you're going to do during difficult times. I just barely had somebody I had to terminate. This person was bringing in over a million dollars a year in revenue through his sales team. And we found out that he was, uh, every year I probably have one person I have to let go. Uh, this individual was taking sales from other people and putting in his name. Uh, taking sales from our office and putting in his name. And you have to decide, is, is it worth a million dollars to let this guy go because he's breaking company policy? And we let him go. And it's, uh, sometimes it can be a tough decision. It's not if you think about it for the long term in terms of what it could do to your organization, how it could poison uh, the rest of the people on that individual's team or in the company. And you know what the problem is with our industry? <laughs> is that he went right down the street and got hired at another firm. And uh, they knew exactly what he did. And they took him anyways. So make that decision early. Something else that's really cool that we're really proud of is that we have an A rating with the Bitter Business Bureau. Never once been sued by an attorney general um, or had a complaint with an attorney general. I think that's really important, but you would think it would almost be a given, right? Oh, and by the way, do you guys know who this person is right here? 
This is Andy Fastow. He's the former CFO of Enron. It was the largest bankruptcy. While I was in college, it was the largest bankruptcy ever to occur in the United States. Um, Andy came and spoke. I'm, I'm part of a, a group of CEOs. There's about 60 of us that meet in Utah. And we actually had Andy come and speak to us. He got out of jail about uh, a few years ago. He was in jail for four and a half years. And he came and talked to us about this slippery slope in terms of how he got there. Ironically, my wife's law firm sued him, well, or sued, his, uh, sued Enron and won $7 billion back for the investors. And she got a $50,000 bonus. So thank you, Andy. I guess. <laughs> Time management. This, this may seem boring. I took a class, I think it was called student effectiveness, and I can't remember. But one of the, one of the most important classes I took at BYU. A few things. So here you got this cute little Frenchie as a customer waiting for your call. Return calls, texts, and emails promptly. Beat deadlines. Avoid the 11th hour syndrome. I can't honestly say I did that when I was in college. There were many, many late nights. Uh, but quality work rarely gets done, if you're honest with yourself during that time. Be early. Always arrive five to 10 minutes prior. And this one here is probably the most important. Daily calendar. Divide your time up in half hour blocks. And then categorize them in, into A's, B's, and C's. A's being most important, B's being need to get done, and C's can be put off till later. Don't mistake movement for achievement. You've got to get your A's done. It's the most important thing. And one of the questions that my professor said, if you learn anything from me in this class, she said, this, it's this question. What is the best use of my time right now? Speaking of time management, Stephen Covey, um, Really respect this man. He's no longer with us, uh, but he was a former professor here at BYU, and uh, you know wrote the seven most highly effective habits for seven most highly effective habits. Uh, leaders are readers. Read one book per month, guys. Your education is a lifelong process. It does not end here. I was the only person I knew that actually kept my business books after I graduated. Everybody else, you know, turn it back in the library to get money or into the bookstore. Becoming an expert in your field. I'm going to final, or finish up with giving 110%. There's no traffic. Um, there, there's really no traffic along the extra mile. Outwork the competition. My, one of my greatest secrets is the amount of time I put into my work. I would not say I'm one of the smartest individuals. To get my GPA, I work probably three times as hard as everybody else. I'm not somebody that looks at something and instantly memorizes it. I'm in pest control, right? I'm not in the tech world. Uh, just work two, at minimum two hours extra per day over the eight hour normal uh, you know, that our society has seemed to come up with. Um, I would say go above and beyond that. You're going to have to be okay with that. Good is the enemy of great. We're all going to have this decision between good, better, and best. Everybody knows that best is the right decision. It's just are you really willing to put in that extra amount of effort to make it happen? And I love this quote by Bill Watton. Don't measure yourself by what you, ha by what you have accomplished, but instead by what you should have accomplished. And enjoy the journey. Fun is the secret to our success. Richard Branson, um, great role model. Uh, this is us taking a bunch of the guys out skydiving. It's a big part of what we do. We're happiness when we're striving for our true potential. And I got to be honest, guys, our, uh, my degree right now is sitting in a box in my basement. The education that you take from school and being able to apply it into something that's what, I hope that's why you're going in, for some of you, going into debt or why, you know, what you're paying for. There's so many people that they keep saying, someday it's going to be better. Someday I'll be happy, right? So you know, there's the story of the elementary student that says, someday when I'm in high school, then I'll be the big man on campus. And then the person gets to high school and he says, when I'm in college, then I'll finally be happy. And then for LDS folks, when I go on a mission, someday then I'll be happy. Um, most rewarding two years of my life. Um, happiest from time to time, yes. <laughs> but, and then the idea is, well, when I get back to school and I get married, then I'll truly be happy. Oh, well, then when I have children or then when I have a job and I'm out of school, then I'll be happy. And you go through all these scenarios. Then when the kids are out of the house someday, then I'll be happy because my wife and I will have finally time to go do something. And then when all the kids are out of the house, you say, well, Man, I really miss college. Those were fun times. I miss, I miss the friends I had back then. And then it's, I really miss working hard. When I had the time to put into it to you know, build a team and, and build an amazing business. And then, I, man, I really wish the kids were still around. It sure is lonely now. I see my parents going through that. 
hell on earth is meeting the man that you could someday become or that you could have become. I'm going to finish up with this last quote by Tony Shea. A great brand is a story that never stops unfolding. And you could recreate, if, you, if you'd like, you could replace brand with man or woman. A great man or woman is a story that never stops unfolding. So thank you for your time. Yeah, go ahead. So I have a question. You sold two pest control companies before you started Altera. That's right. Did you not just sign a non-compete, or how did that Sure. I did sign a non-compete. So in Southern California, I had a non-compete, couldn't go back to Southern California. When I structured the second deal, I said, look, I've got too many families. I can't move everybody around. And so I said, I will not steal your customers, but I still want the ability to, to go around. And if you want to buy the business, that's the way the deal is going to work. And they agreed. Yeah. Definitely not normal. Remember, you can always negotiate in a deal. And if you've been doing sales for a long time, it's probably in your blood to do it. How are those companies doing now? So when I sold the companies, I didn't sell them as a whole. I sold the assets. So I sold the customer base. And then my employees were able to go over there with a higher increase in pay. Uh, I never sold the golden goose, though. So I kept my sales force. I kept my executive team. I kept my operations managers. And so I did, it's really just selling off a customer base. And selling to Terminex is, uh, they've, they've done okay with the customers. Uh, if, you, if you do more as a company and they sell to another company, it doesn't quite do as much. Sometimes, you know, the customers will leave. Yeah? How many years did you sell it on, on the doors? Before? I sold for four years on the doors. And my last year, I sold 903. So I, I believe that was a big part in, in terms of my ability to create a sales training program that you know, sales reps would want to come work for. Yeah? How have you kept your company and your, uh, your employees' morals while doing door sales? Because obviously that I've been door sales is a hard thing to do. What, what, was, what was your opinion? What did you do? Uh, I, I really think it's leadership from the top. So. If you're telling the guys, hey, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, and your training manual is very specific, and the way that you train people has to do with you know, honesty all the way through, the culture will actually shun out those that would try to do it differently. So other things, we, uh, we do background checks, we do drug testing, we do personality tests to make sure we get the right people in the door. And almost everybody comes through some sort of referral. We're probably one of the summer sale, few summer sales companies that does not hire everybody. We probably only hire about 70% of those that interview with us. Um, at other companies, if you got a pulse, they're, they're good. Yeah? What's your uh, boarding routine? When you say boarding? Morning routine. Morning routine. So I wake up typically around 5 a.m. Uh, we'll try to work out. It's one area I'm actually weak at, so I will admit it. Um, at 6 o'clock, I you know, get ready, eat breakfast, head down to work at 7. Uh, I live up in Holiday, Utah, so I'm about 40 minutes away. I uh, work throughout the day until about 7 o'clock at night, go home, get home around 8 o'clock, and uh, hang out with my family at dinner. a great question. So balance is up here. So it, remember when I talked about hobbies in the very beginning? If business becomes your hobby and it excites you, it's no longer work. And I think that the term workaholic uh, has this negative connotation to it. But do you really believe a workaholic is unhappy? They love what they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't probably keep doing it. The secret is you just have to be careful with your family. You've got to make sure that your family's on board with it. 
And as you start to have a family, you're going to have to, well, for most people, you're going to have to find ways to scale back to make it realistic. Because my, my children are young, or my child is young, and I've got another one on the way. My wife and I, we waited to have children for a while. Uh, that was a conscious decision so that she could do her law school, you know, get a law, law degree and get some experience, and then, you know, be able to potentially go back to law at some point. And for me, because she was on that track, it worked out very, very well for me. And um, I honestly, I couldn't be happier. It's been an amazing experience. And now I have the time, I do have the time to be able to, to put into my family. Whereas those first years, I honestly, I wouldn't. So for a lot of people, if you're trying to decide whether to be an entrepreneur or an employee or intrapreneur within an organization, you gotta make that decision. Like financially, can I afford it? Is it worth the risk? Family-wise, can I, can I afford it with my family? Is my wife really on board with that? Um, do I have so many kids that financially just it would never make sense? I can't take on that risk at this point in my life. So de definitely things to think about as you're going into entrepreneurship. It is not easy for most, most people.